So I'll move to, like I said, I did about seven interviews um, over the space of uh, many weeks, um, you know, late 2019, early in January 2020. So I'm going to um, not show them all here. I selected a few, but I'll, I'll jump forward five days from this last video. And I talk about the... Um, I talk about the uh, animal life. Australia's wildfires deadly for koalas was the topic of the, and I don't choose these topics. This was um, what they talked about. Bring in now uh, climate system scientist Paul Beckwith. Paul, thanks a lot for your time today. Thanks for having me. I mean, the conditions there are, are just. Uh, unbelievable extreme a code red we understand was now issued in south australia on friday that's when temperatures hit over 40 degrees celsius talk to us first a little bit about um the conditions that these firefighters are this facing. this was at my mother-in-law's house this is my her christmas tree fires well the uh temperature is she's in oshawa hot, uh, as Ontario. you mentioned but uh, also there's been just no rainfall uh, they're in a they're in a massive drought uh, third year running and uh, all the vegetation everything's just completely dried out so it's like a tinderbox. This, box and this is uh, when you combine that with the high yeah, winds uh, that they're receiving. December twenty eighth. Um, it's a very tough job for the firefighters. Yeah, very difficult job. Can't imagine how dense the air must be. And you mentioned that drought. Four minutes there. and seen nine seconds. In terms of it's been uh, at least video. twelve months in, in terms of looking at this year since they've had any kind of rain. And now it's not just you know what what's happening now there to the to to the, the to the bush to the trees and whatnot, but how it's affecting the wildlife. We heard there in that report, kangaroos and deer, um, they may be able to survive and get out of these conditions, run away from that. But of course, the koala bears uh, can't do that. Uh, we're now seeing that a third of them may have been wiped out from uh, be wiped out because of these bushfires. Um, what is the concern here? Are we potentially looking at uh, them being on uh, the extinction list? Yes. Well, these fires are quite different from uh, you know Australia's always, always had wildfires. You know we've had them in Canada as mm -hmm. well known with Fort McMurray, but uh, the conditions are so dry and so hot there that actually even the rainforests uh, where there generally aren't fires are, are drying out and there's fires there. There's huge uh, forests of uh, eucalyptus trees that are generally wetter um, regions and those are also drying out and there's fires. And, you know, a typical year in New South Wales might just might burn about 280,000 hectares and this year it's, it's uh, 3.4 million. So it's about 11 times more area that is burning and these fires are also hot and they're creating their own type of weather systems as well. Mm -hmm. So what do you think can be done? Um, we were talking about more uh, heat waves coming through uh, all into this weekend, into next week. So that's obviously not going to manage things. What would you say the strategy is right now then? Well, I think the, um, you know, the, the strategy has to be uh, to um, deal with the root cause of the problem, which mm -hmm. is uh, very rapid uh, climate change. Um, this was uh, the, the, the situation in Australia right now was actually very predictable uh, three or four months ago because there's, there was an event over Antarctica called the sudden stratospheric warming where the upper atmosphere of um, Antarctica warmed and that split the polar vortex and that uh, caused the jet streams to shift locations. So the jet streams aren't behaving normally mm -hmm. and therefore we're getting tremendous drought and, and heat waves in Australia in excess of what they've ever seen before in fact. Before I let you go, Paul, in terms of the aftermath uh, and being able to rebuild from this, how um, how difficult is that going to be, not just for the people there, but of course, ensuring that there is a, a proper area for the wildlife? Yeah, well, there, there have, I mean, there, there, this is a country that is, uh, that is it's, it's, um, affected extremely severely from uh, climate change, mm -hmm. uh, from the change of the jet streams and things. So. We really need to, we, we basically, there, there's one thing that's important for climate change, and that's the level of CO2 in the atmosphere. And that keeps rising at ever increasing rate. Until we flatten that curve and bring it down, we're going to see more and more problems like Australia is having all around the world. It is such a horrific situation for them out there. We're going to keep a close eye on those things. Paul Beckworth, really appreciate your expertise in giving us your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so 
that was the second video. And a key point to remember is that what is really, really important is the level of CO2 in the atmosphere, right? And that number is rising at ever record rates. And until that curve flattens out, level, stops rising at ever increasing rates, flattens and then decreases, um, you know, we need to decrease it by actively removing CO2 out of the atmosphere. And uh, I've talked about some of the methods and people are starting to get serious about this, at least in terms of doing more and more research, but we need to deploy systems at large scale to do this. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's the key metric. Okay, so now I'll move on um, to a couple days later. Um, I was back on the uh, CTV once again. So I'll just play that clip here. The wildfire crisis in Australia is raging out of control. The military is being deployed as crews struggle to contain. You can see the date up here. Fires in the states of New South that will Wales help and your, your search if you want to in find it on the web. Malakuta, thousands were forced to flee in an apocalyptic scene. People sought shelter on beaches and in boats as flames closed in. At least four people are missing. Many homes have been destroyed. Australian officials are asking for more support for both Canada and the U.S. Both countries have already sent dozens of personnel. This is one of the worst wildfire seasons on record. So far, 12 people have been killed. Millions of hectares of land have been burned. Paul Beckwith joins me now. He's a climate system scientist. He joins me from Ottawa. Thanks a lot for your time today. Thank you. You and I, last time we spoke, we talked about how uh, dire the situation is, and it appears things have gotten escalated much worse today, Paul, uh, than we last spoke. Yes, and um, I mean, not only are we losing the uh, trees, you know, as they burn, uh, it produces carbon dioxide, which adds to the CO2 load, the greenhouse gas load in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. but also those trees are no longer available to uh, remove uh, CO2 from the atmosphere uh, via photosynthesis. And also, you know, we don't know for sure that these trees will be replaced, for example, by by new trees, because if the if the temperature stays warm and if the precipitation has changed, mm -hmm. maybe we'll have grassland growing where the trees used to be, for example. Right, because depending on how much uh, how much damage is done to the earth. Now, what we understand now is weather conditions over the next 24 hours are expected to improve, but then things are going to sort of uh, worsen again. And of course, Australia entering the middle of its summer period. So. In that little bit of reprieve, Paul, what do you think can be done there? Is that going to give uh, firefighters a little bit of an edge? Well, I, I hope it would allow them to at least uh, get more of the existing fires under control mm -hmm. before the uh, heat really picks up again. But, you know, water is a huge issue there. Right? Where, where are they getting, you know, if the fires are close to the uh, ocean, you know, I guess you can have water bombers picking up seawater and, and dumping that on the fires. But if they're far inland, it becomes a lot more difficult because water is always been an issue in Australia. Is there another method, perhaps, uh, other than water um, that they could possibly look to, whether sand might be another uh, possibility, or because the fires are so hot, um, that's not an option and, and, and water is the best method? Yeah, I, th I think what they, uh, sh what they focus on is on uh, protecting um, infrastructure, you know, mm -hmm. cities and towns. So what they can do is they can build kind of fire breaks around these locations um, and even do, you know, pre, you know, very carefully controlled pre-burns of areas to like burn a sort of Or I guess rake the, the uh, leaves as, as uh, so if there is a fire, somebody uh, once you know, said before in, in the recently. Swish and the scrub outside, it won't spread across their fire break. So they can try things just like rake, that. Just rake, just rake. You know, as far as the California fire. systems so. for the public uh, as well when a fire is coming. This has uh, been now considered to be one of the worst seasons uh, in history. Could this be um, what we can anticipate in the future? Um, I don't think that this is a, it should be a big surprise to, to people. Um, for many years, you know, we've seen the trends to uh, hotter and uh, less rainfall in regions of, of places like Australia. And, uh, 
you know, these fires are, are just coming a result of that. And not only is it, you know, these fires are igniting from all different reasons. It's, it's, some of them are, you know, human caused, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of these fires are burning so hot, they're creating their own so-called pyrocumulus clouds, which mm -hmm. can create lightning um, and maybe perhaps not even rainfall. And that lightning can spark additional fires, as well as the burning embers are carried further away from the uh, where the fire is and they can trigger a secondary tertiary fire uh, right. far away from the original fire and we've seen some fire tornadoes uh forming there as well paul yes 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 the fire tornado picked up one of the fire trucks and uh you know two of the people got out but the third person was killed a volunteer firefighter we've seen these fire tornadoes also in california mm -hmm. especially where, where where there was the fire that went through paradise california and it destroyed the whole village a few years ago right. we've also seen fire tornadoes um resulting in from the fort mcmurray fire mm -hmm. i believe and uh you know any really of these, these these fires are burning hotter and they're burning over larger areas and they're creating such strong updrafts that they do spin off these fire tornadoes which is a fairly new, fairly new phenomenon yeah such a devastating situation from all of them and of course our hearts go out to all of the people there and the uh, firefighters and first responders paul beckwith climate system scientist great to have you back on the program uh important information you've been able to give us here paul thank you thank you for having me you're welcome nothing short of apocalyptic that's how wildfire conditions are okay so um this was at the uh december 30th and then on the 31st um i had another interview with with ctv and then there was one on um and i guess uh cbc you know national um the national um news station um both radio and tv and print in canada um i guess they watch some of these ct video ctv television videos and they're a private broadcaster as opposed to the public cbc and they said hey we got to get this guy on so i was on cbc on January 2nd. So here we go here. This was the CBC interview. Um, and this interview is seven minutes long and I don't hold back any punches. So, you know, it was live and I'm not sure how many times they played it. Um, but I, I, I can send you the link if you request or, or because, um, you know, I can't, it's, um, yeah, it's a good, it's a, it's a good, in, it's a good interview. And then I did another interview with CTV um, I believe it was January 6th or somewhere around then. And um, they called and said, can you come on in an hour? And I said, sure, but I was in a coffee shop. I said, as long as you don't mind me doing the filming um, from inside a coffee shop. I said, we can do a test and, you know, I'll use uh, earphones and it should be fine. So I did that and it was about uh, five minutes <laughs> into the interview and, and my phone battery died. I'd forgotten to, to charge it. So I don't know if there's a, a, a recording online um, for that interview, but also that was a very interesting uh, interview. During the live broadcast, my phone just completely died. So let's just uh, listen now to the um, CBC News Network interview with Hannah Thibodeau. Okay, um, 